thank you for coming out tonight. Thank you for coming to think about how our government works and to consider how you might get involved in helping to make sure that every vote counts and that every voice is heard. When you think about the way our government works right now, you might feel like your voice is not necessarily heard, that the policies that you care about are not necessarily the policies that are getting enacted. And the reason you might think that is because it's the case. There were researchers in Princeton several years ago who analyzed how public opinion impacted public policy. And what they discovered is that when the preferences of the economic elites, that means the very wealthy people, and the stands of organized interest groups, that means the very, very deep pocket lobby groups, when those were taken out of the picture, the preference of the average American appeared to have a minuscule, near zero, statistically non-significant impact upon public policy. That's a lot of different ways to say no impact at all. What you care about does not impact what happens in Congress. But it is also true in Harrisburg. It doesn't have to be true. It's not cooked into our government. And there are many governments around the world where the goals and concerns of the public are, are translated into public policy. And there are states in this country that do a really excellent job of that. Pennsylvania is not one of those states, and we're going to be looking at that this evening, trying to understand why that is. So to get there, we're going to, we're going to do a little bit of vocabulary, a little bit of history, a little geography, a little math. So vocabulary, reapportionment. By law, there are 435 seats in the House of Representatives. Those need to be distributed across the states as equally as possible, and population keeps shifting across the states. So every 10 years, there's a census. Every year that ends in zero, there's a census. The seats are reapportioned after each census so that they, the population is divided fairly equally into the congressional districts, 435 of them. So some states will gain, some states will lose. Pennsylvania has been losing a district or two after every census. Uh, we went from 19 after 2000 to 18 after, after 2011. And the next time around, we are expected to lose another seat. We'll be down to 17. This triggers redistricting. Once those, those, those seats have been reapportioned, they need to be redrawn so that they, again, are kept fairly evenly, even populations across the districts. Congressional districts are done state by state. Each state decides how they want to do it. And in Pennsylvania, it's done as a simple law, a bill that's introduced in Harrisburg by the majority party, voted on by both houses, and then signed into law by the governor. Legislative redistricting is done differently. In Pennsylvania, it's a five-person commission. Four of them are majority and minority leaders or people that they choose. Usually they choose to do it themselves. The fifth is chosen by those four leaders, and if they can't agree, and I cannot find a recent moment in history when they did agree, then the state Supreme Court chooses that fifth person. That was the commission that we had last time. Every commission that I've seen has been five white guys, and they go in a back room and they draw the map, which leads us to this next word, which is gerrymandering. Manipulation of electoral maps for political advantage. One of the earliest to do this was Governor Elbridge Gerry of Massachusetts. In 1812, he approved a map that looked like a salamander. The papers loved it, and they called it the gerrymander, and that word has been used to this day. The same people who draw the maps have a vested interest in creating districts that help them stay in office and that's a conflict of interest that threatens the integrity of our elections, and we are the only major democracy that allows legislators any role in drawing their own electoral districts. Now, to understand gerrymandering, you might have seen this graphic. If you had a population that was 60% blue, 40% red, you could draw a, a district map in that way, perfect representation, so you end up with three blue districts and two red districts. They wouldn't be competitive districts, but you would have fair representation for the population that you have. If you have blue drawing the lines, you could end up with five blue districts. Even though 40% of the population is red, you could shut the red voice out completely. But if red somehow got control of the whole process, they could draw it in a way that they ended up with the majority. Now this is a pretty common explanation of gerrymandering. I don't like it very much because it assumes that we're all red or blue, and it treats us like we're all pawns in a partisan game, and the reality is we're people. 
and we are not all red or blue. And those of us who are red are different shades of red. And those who are blue are different shades of blue. And some of us will vote red or blue every time. It doesn't matter what the other person, what the candidate does. And some of us actually want to know who that person is. Are they competent? Do they have integrity? Are they going to deliver what they say? And then there's those of us who are independent. There are some of us who are Green Party, Libertarian Party. Pennsylvania has a prohibition party. I don't know if you knew that, but it's still in, in act, it's still active and they have endorsed us, which I'm very proud of. Um, so, so imagine you have a population like that, that is people. Lots of different kinds of people, lots of different kinds of opinions, and you drew district lines this way. Who would you be appealing to in every election? Everybody. You would have to have solutions that appealed to everybody. And there would be some who wouldn't agree, but you would have to get a majority of people across the board, across the spectrum to think, yes, that makes sense. And with these kinds of districts, if you didn't deliver, if you said, I'm going to do this thing, and then you went and did that thing, next time, you would be out. But imagine that you have somebody drawing the lines for themselves. You could do a sweetheart gerrymander, and that's one in which you draw the lines to create very safe districts for both sides. The first time I met with my state senator, who is no longer my state senator, and raised this question with him, he said, you know, it's really not a problem. My colleague of the opposite party, we sit down and we look at the map and we divide up the neighborhoods. He didn't understand why I was not impressed. But what they were doing was choosing their voters, and he was telling me, a voter, it's fine that you don't have a choice because we have a choice. That's a sweetheart gerrymander. Another way to do gerrymandering is cracking. And cracking is taking a, take, when the majority party takes the minority party and splits it across, splits it out into neighboring regions so that population has no voice at all. If you look across the map of Pennsylvania, our state house and senate maps, you will see community after community after community cracked. If you look at anywhere you see strange things going on, like you see that, see the pink district wandering through Beaver Falls and then <laughs> heading off to the mountains. There's a reason for that. There's a community in the heart of that that's been denied a voice. In this case, it's the Beaver, Beaver Falls area. It's an industrial area. It's poor, and it's been completely deprived of a voice by being split into four house districts, which then go out into the rural areas around it, and that voice is completely lost. That's cracking. We have lots of it here in Pennsylvania. Packing is when you take voters and put them into a district at the highest possible percentage. And some of our, some of our right now, our Democratic districts are like 95% Democrat. How is that possible? And if you look at that, that's the old Congressional District 1, wandering around to, to put as many Democrats into one district as possible. That's packing. There's another story going on with that particular district, which has to do with racial packing as well, or racial gerrymandering to keep a white candidate in office, even as the district was shifting toward minority. That's an interesting story. I'm not going to go into it too much, except to say that it went wandering way far into the Northeast, way down into media, a very white Democratic community, to keep a white candidate who was a leader in his party in office. So when people say the Democrats voted for that congressional map, there's a reason. The candidates were, who were given safe districts wanted the map because it kept them in office, even though it harmed their party, and even though it very much harmed the communities that were separated out in that very strange way. Now, I mentioned that gerrymandering has been around since 1812, but it hasn't been the same since 1812. And there are people who say, why are you thinking about this now? It's been going on for a long time. And we say, yes. Do you see anything different here? <laughs> so what happened? How did it go from fairly compact to something called Goofy Kicking Donald, that one down the bottom right, uh, District 7. Well, mapping technology, think about what you can do on your phone these days that you couldn't do 10 or 15 years ago. And data mining, think of all the data available. So much data about how people vote, about the, the margins of victory in each precinct, all that data is available. This particular map, um, Azavia, they're a, one of our endorsing organizations in Philly, they're a mapping organization, they got the, the data that was released during one of the recent lawsuits. They called it Terzai production data because majority leader Mike Terzai was the one who released the data under court order. 
clearly that data was used in drawing our House and Senate districts and our congressional districts. And if you start looking closely, you can see the reasons for the way that the districts were drawn. You can see that they were drawn to, to, to take little bits of blue and surround them by big bits of red. And to take a region, this whole southwestern part of Pennsylvania would be one of the most purple areas in the country. And yet, it was drawn to make sure it's not purple. So when we started in January 2016, we knew gerrymandering was a problem. We just didn't know how to quantify it. And we didn't know where we stood relative to other states. During that year of 2016, there was some interesting work being done and there was a lawsuit that took place in Wisconsin on the efficiency gap. At a certain point, I read the study on the efficiency gap and said, oh my goodness, the people who wrote that study were saying, states that meet a certain level in this should consider litigation. And according to their study, Pennsylvania was the worst. So according to the efficiency gap, we were the worst. Our 2011 map was the worst. And then there's another way to measure it. It's called seats to vote skew. And what that means is you have a certain number of votes. You have a certain number of seats. They ought to match up fairly well. And when they have a really big gap, there's something funny going on. And according to seat to vote skew, our 2011 congressional map was the worst in the country. There's some other ways to measure it. I'm not going to go into it. Um, if you're a, a math geek, it's kind of fun to get in there and, and look at them. But according to the five currently used standards, Pennsylvania was the worst in two, next worst in one, and then among the five worst in the other two. And if you average it all out, according to these standards, our 2011 map was the worst in the country. Which is why the League said, seriously, um, and, and joined a lawsuit with the Public Interest Law Center. People said, well, this is because of the 2016 election. Everybody's upset about that. Um, why is the League getting involved? The League actually, I don't know if you know this, in 1991, the League gave testimony to our State Legislative Reapportionment Commission and said, could you please read the Constitution and follow it? That didn't happen. In 1992, local League said, you did not read the Constitution. You have not followed the rule that we have as minimal splits as possible and we keep our districts compact. So local leagues actually sued the state. It didn't get anywhere, but that was in 1992. Um, in 2007, 2008, Representative Steve Samuelson introduced a bill um, to address the redistricting problem. The league helped get 96 co-sponsors for that bill. It never made it out of committee. Interestingly, the committee chair at the time was a Democrat. Steve Samuelson is a Democrat. He said, why are you not giving this bill a hearing? The Democrats thought they were going to have the upper hand in the 2011 redistricting. And so they said, shh, we don't really need to do this right now. Well, something happened between 2008 and 2011. That's a different story. But both sides have deliberately blocked any attempt at reform for over a quarter of a century. So in 2016, the bills that we were supporting went nowhere. In 2017, we started the session off saying, please, give these bills a hearing. And it became incredibly clear that was not going to happen. And the League said, all right, we will do what we need to do and file the lawsuit. And as you know, uh, the Public Interest Law Center and Arnold and Porter, the pro bono law firm that worked with them, they decided to address the state constitution rather than the federal because there were already two cases tied up in federal court and they're still tied up in federal court. They said our state constitution has better protections than the U.S. constitution for voters and they addressed the lawsuit to the state constitution and as you know, they won. Now does, does this matter? Do maps matter? That's a question. And people say, oh, you know, it's just where people live. It's the way people sort themselves in our cities. Maps matter. So if you look at what happened in 2016, here's the seat to vote skew from 2016. 46% Democrat, 54% Republican. Look at how many seats the Democrats got and how many the Republicans got. That's a really big difference between votes cast and seats won. With a new map, look at what happened. Much, much more even. It's still not exactly even, but much closer. Maps do matter. And they matter for things like representation that looks like us as the people. So before 2018, Pennsylvania ranked 49th out of the 50 states for women in elected office. 
Only Mississippi was worse. I don't know how you feel when you see a statistic like that, but I feel sick. There's no reason that we should be in that space. As of 2019, we now have a, the first woman in Congress since 2014, four years without a woman in Congress. The first time ever that we've had more than two women in Congress at a time. And even so, it's still less than 25% of our congressional delegation. But it's a big change, a big, a big jump. Lawsuits, though, are at best divisive, confusing, and expensive. They are not the final solution. And they are partial and temporary remedy. Temporary because in 2021, all the lines will be drawn again after the census. And partial because it addressed the congressional districts and did nothing for our state house and senate districts. Now, the congressional districts are the ones that have had the most attention. They're the ones that are the easiest to quantify and to compare. Um, but there are some organizations in the last year that have begun working really hard to say, well, where do state legislatures, where do they, where do they line up? Princeton Gerrymandering Project has been doing some testing on this. And according to them, there are six states that fail all the tests for fairness that they've run. We are one of those six. And this might be of interest to you. After the 2018 election, uh, the Washington Post printed a little graphic to show the seat to vote skew in state legislatures. According to that graphic, according to their research, we had the worst seat to vote skew in the country in 2018. 54% of blue votes, 45% of seats. That's a nine percentage point skew. The next two states, Michigan and North Carolina, had six percentage point skew. We're 50% 50 50 worse than the next two worst states for state legislative districts. Part of, part of what gerrymandering does is it locks in advantage and it blocks voters' voices. And you can look at this in 2014, there was a 4% skew, 2016 a 6 to 7% skew. This year there was a huge attempt by blue voters to come out and have their voices heard. And what we see is the skew got worse. So that it was 9% skew in 2018. And, and part of what happens with this too is lack of choice. Because if, if a district is drawn for a particular person or a particular party, why would somebody try to run against them? It's a hard job and you get nowhere. So if you look in 2014, 58%, 58% of our legislative races had no opposition in the general election. 58%. In 2016, it was down to 48%. Still, that's half. Half of our races had no opposition in the general election. This past year, there were lots of people who said, we're just gonna run because this is wrong, and they ran, um, but we still had 38% that had no opposition in the general election. And there were some people who ran amazing campaigns and went door to door to door to door and still got blocked out by barricaded districts drawn to shut out their voice. I've spoken in some of those places, and when you start looking at the map, you can see exactly exactly what happened in those districts, just looking at the map and the, and the data. So our Constitution says, unless absolutely necessary, no county, city, incorporated town, borough, township, or ward shall be divided in forming a senatorial or representative district. And as I said, you can go across the state and see place after place after place where that has been completely ignored. Allentown area is cracked into three districts. Look at the weird little tail on this 22nd district. <laughs> Seriously, <laughs> Montgomery County by number should have four state Senate districts and said it has parts of six, none of them completely in the county, all of them sprawling across into other counties. 24, that's part of, of you here in Bucks County, um, goes through three different counties. Your county should have two and a half um, and you have parts of four. And when you start looking at it, you think, well, why did they do that? Why, why would that district go that way? And it's really interesting to get out that as of, to go onto that as of your website and then look closely. And you might think, oh, we're, we're all one way or all another way. When you start to look, you realize we're a very purple, very purple state. We've got pockets of blue, pockets of red, lots of pockets of purple, and it takes great precision. It takes great work. This is hard work to carve it up in such a way that you can control the outcomes of elections. One other thing to mention though is when you go to gerrymander, if you're a leader who is gerrymandering, one of the things you do is you create the safest possible seat for yourself and for your cronies, but you also need numeric advantage, which means some of your districts 
need to be carved kind of thin. So you spread your people to get a majority. So you might be trying to pack as many Democrats into one district as possible, but then you need to kind of spread your Republicans out. And what happens is you end up with, with some districts that are kind of dangerous for your folks. And so the people that you like least or want least, this is true, you put them in the most jeopardized districts. So the moderate Republicans are the ones who go first. They're the ones who are put into, into, into crazy districts that could be flipped fairly easily, but the people who have kept themselves in power a long time and are going to keep themselves in power, look at the margins that they've put using this data. There's a lot of different things, different stories. The more you know, the more you see the stories of under, underneath of what's happening. And the angrier, I confess, you get. And I'm not an angry person, but every time I go to speak and I look at the district maps, it makes me angry to think of the communities that have been blocked from any kind of representation representation by the gamesmanship that goes into drawing these maps. It's not just about parties. And that's the thing. Gerrymandering often is presented as one party against another. It is not about parties. It's about people, people like us whose voices are shut out. And it's also about policy. We started talking about policy. Are the policies you care about enacted? And with gerrymandering, it makes it almost impossible for the policies you care about to be heard, to be voted on, and to be put into place. There's a really important study done last year by Catherine Gale and Michael Porter from the Harvard Business School, Why Competition in the Politics Industry is Failing America. And they talk about the duopoly, the two-party duopoly that thrives on a narrative of division, of saying they're the enemy, they're the ones who are doing it wrong, and waving flags, and each side has their flag that they wave to get people angry and to get people to vote the way they want them to vote. And, and there's a lot of money in this. They call it the political industrial complex. And they talk about the money that's there and the reasons that political industrial complex wants to keep the current structures in place. There's a lot of power, there's a lot of money, there's a lot of influence for both sides. But as people, we pay the cost. Devastating implications for citizens. Divisive rhetoric, gridlock, unfulfilled promises, no attempt at solutions incentives not to solve problems, because once you figure out a reasonable solution, you can't wave that flag anymore, so you don't want to do that. You want to just keep accusing the other side. No accountability and no countervailing forces to restore healthy competition. So how does that play out for us in Pennsylvania? The policy issue that drew me into this question, into this topic, was school funding inequity. And I was concerned. I was a youth pastor. I worked in a very poor community, but I was I, I was from a wealthy community with a partnership in a poor community, and I was stunned to see the incredible difference in the school funding. The kids who needed school counselors the most had one school counselor in a school. These are kids who don't know anybody in college, who see trauma every day, and yet they have one school counselor, whereas the kids who had every kind of therapy you could think of, they, everybody they knew had a doctorate or, a, or was a lawyer or had been to graduate school, those kids had counselors following them around in the halls, asking them, which college are you going to go to? I was stunned at the inequity, and it's built into our state policy. It points to Harrisburg. That's where these decisions are made. And when I started studying it, I found out we have, as of the last time I looked, and I haven't found any research to contradict this, the greatest inequity in school funding in the country, twice that of the, next, of the, of the state average, and a long shot worse than the next most inequitable state, which is Vermont. If you look at the numbers, kids at a school like Bryn Athen get three times the, the funding in their school per kid than a school like Mount Carmel. Philadelphia is in the middle. And some of these are poor rural schools, some are, some are poor urban schools, but what this is saying is that your zip code matters completely on what kind of future you will have. Will you be a productive member of our workforce? Since I've been working on this, I've come across many, many, many policy issues that you would think simple economics would say this should be fixed. This is expensive not to fix. It's costing us a great deal to leave this unresolved, and yet these things go unresolved. And in each session, there are really good bills introduced. There are great people in our state legislature who would love to fix these things for the people of Pennsylvania. They introduce bills that go nowhere. So lead poisoning. I stumbled across this one and was really stunned. We have 18 cities in Pennsylvania 
that have higher levels of lead exposure than Flint, Michigan. And by a long, by a lot. This isn't just a little bit more, this is by a lot more. And in Flint, Michigan, the lead is in the water. So you can get around that by buying bottled water. In Pennsylvania's cities, the lead is in the air. You can't get around it by buying bottled air. So states around us that have aging housing have enacted policies that require mandated lead testing of children at certain ages and then mandated remediation because they found that every dollar invested in lead hazard control resu results in a societal savings of as much as $221. How they got that exact number, I don't know. But when you think, a kid who gets lead poisoning, the brain damage that results is going to need extensive medical care the rest of their lives. They will never be a productive member of our communities. They will never be able to work. Their families will struggle to care for them all of their lives. It's a huge, huge cost. Wouldn't it make sense to figure out where that's happening and to solve it? And every session, there are legislators from those cracked out little communities, those cracked out cities like Allentown, who introduced legislation and it doesn't even move out of committee. Last year, the um, Pennsylvania Economy League came out with a study, Communities in Crisis, that talked about fiscal decay, fiscal decay in Pennsylvania's municipalities. And this is big municipalities, little municipalities, all across the state. They said there's an alarming trend of fiscal distress that's been going on for 24 years and is getting worse. And they said the reason is that the state has ignored requests to address this. And they say that our municipalities are creatures of the state, formed, structured, governed by state statutes that date back as far as 1803. And think about how much has changed in Pennsylvania since 1803. So the local government commission of the Pennsylvania General Assembly identified over 6,000 mandated state provisions that govern our municipalities, 6,000, that they say need to be updated. All of them need to be updated. Taxes, planning, think about stormwater planning. Right now in Pennsylvania, stormwater planning is municipality by municipality. Think about that. What one community does impacts the water flowing through that. We have I don't know where you live. I don't know if you have flooding. I live in Downingtown. When there's the stormwater, the library parking lot has to be cleared. They start saying, if you're parked in the far end of the parking lot, please move, please move your car. And if it keeps raining, eventually the whole parking lot has to be clear. Our high school floods. This is all managed at a local level, and yet it's completely impacted by what happens upstream. Think of all the money wasted on duplication of effort and how much could be resolved if our state legislature would address that? And yet, it hasn't happened. Over 6,000 mandated state provisions, more than half required, and none of them have been addressed. In fact, we've started studying the way our, our, our government, our local government, our, our state government works um, at the request of some past legislators who said, you need to understand how procedural rules work how procedural rules are put in place and how they impact what happens in Harrisburg. Procedural rules are voted on on the first day of each session. So they could be changed. They're not in the Constitution. They're not in law. They're simply voted on the first day of each session. And so procedural rules are tweaked session by session. And if the people who tweak them are gradually putting more and more power in the hands of less and less people, then your representatives have less and less say about the things that matter to you. So we've started to study this. We're still in the early stages. But one thing we came across was Pennsylvania's in the bottom 25% in total number of bills passed, far, far, far behind the other full-time legislatures. And we were among the five lowest in the states in terms of percent of bills introduced that get passed. Now, there are people who'd say, oh, well, it's really good that we're not passing bills because, you know, government, you know, government's terrible. And I would say, well, look at those 6,000 statutes that govern what happens in your state legislatures. At this rate, <laughs> if, if 300 of these were being passed a year, how long would that take us even just to address that? And the truth is, a lot of these bills that get passed are naming roads, naming bridges, and naming holidays. We've got some folks researching, trying to find out how many substantive bills get 
passed, and the number is frighteningly low. So connect the dots on all of this. Partisan redistricting, unaccountable government, gridlock. I've added another one, unfair procedural rules. I had no idea that this was a thing when we started, and yet the more we see, the more convinced we are this matters a great deal. How is it that one committee chair can simply say, we're not going to look at that bill. We're not going to think about that bill. We don't care about that bill. How is that possible? So, so, so a legislator drafts a bill about lead poisoning, introduces it in the appropriate committee, and the committee chair says, we're not interested in lead poisoning, and nothing ever happens. The bill that we were supporting on redistricting reform, 110 co-sponsors, most of any in the session, and the committee chair said, we're not going to talk about that. So when the prime sponsor attempted a discharge petition, which is a procedural rule to get a bill moved out of committee so it gets heard, he took the bill, introduced, called a, called a, committee, called a committee meeting with less than 24-hour notice, didn't announce the agenda, and then handed out at the meeting an amendment to the amendment that completely gutted the amendment and put something completely different in place. No one had time to read it. No one had time to discuss it. They voted for the amendment, but then they didn't vote on the bill. So it never moved out of committee, never went back to the floor to be changed. And that's okay, according to our Pennsylvania state legislature. So here's the problem. Leaders draw the districts. The distorted districts protect the incumbents. The incumbents with seniority control the rules. They put in place unfair procedural rules that block reform. And so then they continue to draw the districts. And it's a, it's a recurrent cycle, or what I would call a tight knot of dysfunction. And the only way we break the tight knot of dysfunction is public outcry, public attention, public fury, and, and an insistence that those legislators who refuse to move change will eventually be voted out. It might take a long time to get the public aware enough and attentive enough, but we have to break this because they're not necessarily going to voluntarily break it on their own. And it's interesting, there are many legislators who would like to change this and who have said, we can't do this. The, the, the pressure has to come from outside this building because the legislators inside the building, if they're not committee chairs, if they don't have the seniority, they have no say. They have no way to impact it at all. In studying this, we, I came across this um, agenda fairness in state legislatures, um, a study of the, the procedural rules that govern how bills move. And what Pennsylvania has a zero in agenda fairness is just a handful of states that have 100%. And one of the reasons I was interested in this is we were told when we started, um, no state legislature is ever going to put in place um, redistricting reform. The legislators are not going to give it up. They're not going to give up that power. And yet in Colorado this year, there was a redistricting reform constitutional amendment that passed in Colorado and went to referendum. And I thought, how did that happen? Well, Colorado has 100% agenda fairness. Pennsylvania has a 0% agenda fairness. And the way it played out in Colorado, three legislators on April 18th introduced two constitutional amendments. Three legislators, they didn't get lots of co-sponsors, they didn't have a lot of public attention. They just introduced these two constitutional amendments. They immediately were scheduled for consideration in committee two weeks later. April 5th, April 7th, those constitutional amendments were considered in committee. They were amended on the 5th. There was another small amendment on the 7th. They were immediately scheduled for vote on both the House and Senate floor. On May 16th, they were both voted unanimously by the state legislature. It took them four weeks, four weeks, without public pressure, without outcry, without press, four weeks. That's what agenda fairness looks like. A good idea, a reasonable solution. It's given a hearing, it's given a vote. It went to referendum May 6th of 2018, passed with 71% of the vote. That's the difference. That's why we're looking at House rules. Um, we've been working to get House rules in place. Um, Representative DiGirolamo has um, introduced a resolution to form a committee to study the House rules. Um, there are nine other resolutions that we're supporting, one from Steve Samuelson, Representative Samuelson, that bills co-sponsored by a majority of House members would move immediately to the House floor. 
Another one would be that any bill with 20 co-sponsors from each party would get a committee vote. Another would be that if there's a discharge petition, any bill that, was, that a discharge petition was filed, that bill would immediately go to the House floor. It could not be acted on in committee. No committee chair could do what happened to our bill in this last session. And there's some other ones. Um, we have a page on our website that talks about this, and right now we're actively inviting legislators to think about the rules, to consider the rules and how the rules impact their ability to represent us. So reform the real rules is an important thing that we're talking about. But our real priority is redistricting reform. And we started with the, go the goal of an independent redistricting commission with transparent process, public participation, and a timeline for completion, and to consider other Districting unfairness, for instance, prison gerrymandering. We don't talk a lot about that, but that's an issue of concern and one that we're watching. In 2017 and 18, we supported Senate Bill 22, House Bill Senate 722. The goal was an 11-person commission, three pools of pre-screened pre applicants, um, and then four would be chosen from each major party, three unaffiliated or um, minor party, and the goal would be to a diverse commission that represents the demography of the state. Transparency, public input before public meetings so people could say, don't divide Lehigh Valley. Don't you know, put a district on both sides of the Susquehanna. Um, that kind of public input before the maps are drawn and then a chance for public response after the maps. Um, they'd have to comply with the Voting Rights Act. They'd have to be compact and contiguous. There'd be no provision for the data that's used and they couldn't be drawn to favor a party or a person. Those two bills um, were introduced in the last session. As I said, we got to 110 co-sponsors on the House bill. It never made it out of committee. Senate Bill 22 um, had some good conversation, was amended in the Senate. Um, Senate committee um, was passed unanimously. And then at the last minute, there was a, another amendment added to it, a judicial regional election um, judicial district elections and that was passed but it was um, something that was not favorably looked at by people in the house and the house buried that bill under over 600 amendments and so neither of them um, moved forward we thought we had run out of time and so some of you are here to find out what's going to happen because we thought we had run out of time to get a legislative commission in place for 2021 we spent some time grieving we spent some time thinking what we realized is we ran out of time in terms of one bill that would put independent commission in place for legislative and congressional redistricting. For an amendment to go through, it has to go through two sessions. The earliest it could go to referendum would be May of 2021. So if we put a commission in place by May of 2021, it's too late to select, to train, and have maps drawn by the end of 2021, which is when the next maps need to be drawn. So as I said, we spent some time thinking, what could we do to get around that and came up with this two bill, one commission idea, which is one bill that would address congressional redistricting and one bill that would address legislative redistricting. The congressional one can be passed in this session. The legislative one would need to go through two sessions but the congressional one could be in place in time for putting, training a commission before 2021. And then once the other went to referendum, then the commission would already be in place. So there's two bills. Um, 22 would be the, the constitutional amendment. The reason why 22 is the amendment is Senate Bill 22 is being reintroduced as Senate Bill 22, the same number. Um, we're not supporting it at the moment because it's the same Senate Bill 22 that came out of the Senate last time, which is both, both legislative and congressional in one, in one bill. We don't think there's time to have that in place. There's also some things at the end of that bill that we felt like were not ideal. The original bill that we supported, if the, if the commission couldn't agree on a map, it would go to the, a court appointed special master. There was a lot of concern about that. But the bill that came out of the Senate if there was no agreement, it would go back to the legislature. There was a lot of concern about that. So what, what we thought was we need something different from either of those, and we came up with this other really interesting idea. This is the one big change in terms of the way the commission would work, which is a new fail-safe. So if the special master is not a good solution, 
going back to the legislature kind of defeats the purpose. Um, the idea is to keep the maps within the commission. If they can't agree, they have to do an elimination vote. So for instance, each, each commissioner or each group, group of commissioners could propose a map. So you could have anywhere from two to 11 maps proposed. And then you would do, they would have to propose their map, say why they wanted that map. There'd be a 10 day public, public um, posting of it on a website where anybody could look and say, we like this map, we don't like that map, all the reasons that you want to give. And then there'd be a public vote, which would be an elimination vote. So for instance, I think this is a very gerrymandered map that you, you might recognize that, that's our old one. You might say, I think this is the best one. That's actually Amanda Holt's suggested map. She was the piano teacher turned commissioner who, um, who sued the state back in 2011, but also has been proposing maps. And this is one she proposed during the uh, lawsuit last year. This is actually our new congressional map. I don't know if you recognize it, but you might say, and, and these are not the maps that would be under discussion at the time. This is a sample. Um, but you, one person would be able to you know, put a three on their favorite, a one on their least favorite. Somebody else would say, no, that's my favorite. Um, part of the way the bill is written is they'd have to explain why they're choosing that map. So this is a very public thing. You're having to explain why you want, you know, and I, I can't think of a reason that you could give why you'd want a particularly distorted map like that. This one, Amanda Holt, you could say, because it's the closest to the Constitution, it has the least splits. Mathematically, less splits than this other one. Or you might say this other one um, actually kept it more compact and, and closer to the communities. Um, and then everybody would get their chance to vote. You'd have 11 commissioners voting, add it up. The one with the lowest number is taken off the table and you just continue. So now you've got two, go through, explain why I'm voting. Add it up, the one with the lowest number is taken off the table. Whether you're starting with two maps or 11, you go through that process. At the end, you have a map. We've got some people who have been testing this out and they say, yeah, there's, there's absolutely no way it, it deadlocks. You've got a map. Um, it's also a sneaky way of testing out ranked choice voting. Um, we're not calling it that because to some people, some people think ranked choice voting is one of those evil things they do in those crazy states elsewhere. Um, but it's a way to test that out and say, yeah, it, it gets closest to the public will and it's a way to keep from deadlocking. And it's an interesting way. So this is the, that's the way um, House Bill 22 and 23 would address this. Um, so 22 would be the constitutional amendment. 23 would be a bill addressing the state election code, putting a congressional redistricting commission in place. Um, the, the difference about 23, though, is that's the one that's easier to pass. So that would also have some rules for transparency, for public meetings, and for not splitting more than the Constitution says, with a numeric requirement that congressional districts can't, be, can't split counties more than one time more than mathematically necessary. So a county like Montgomery County, which should have one and a little bit more, mathematically could have only parts of three. Um, a county like this, which should have one, mathematically could have one and maybe split, you know, if it had to be split, it could only have parts of two congressional districts. That's how the bill is written. Um, and that would be done in, both, in all congressional and legislative, no matter what, if the, if the one bill was passed. So that's in place, even if the amendment doesn't get passed, the other bill, if it got passed, would have those requirements for all of them. Timeline, how does this work? This is the big thing. And, and I have to say, there are people already saying, oh, you know, legislative, it's not gonna happen. Don't worry about it, just let it go. I can tell you why <laughs> there are people who don't want it fixed. The fifth person of that legislative commission in 2021 will be chosen by our state Supreme Court. The state Supreme Court leans heavily Democratic, as we heard during the lawsuit, it was called a partisan court, that fifth person will be a Democrat. So if you hear Democrats saying, you know, we've just run out of time, oh well, there's a reason they're saying that, they don't want it to be fixed, and they'd be very happy to let the clock tick out. What we're saying is we don't care a Republican gerrymander or a Democratic gerrymander is toxic to democracy. As our good Congressman just said, it doesn't matter who's doing it, it's wrong, and we will continue to work towards a solution. Um, so the timeline for this. In 2019, both of these bills would be introduced. I believe the co-sponsor memos started circulating today. 
I have not had that confirmed, but this week, I promise you, there will be co-sponsor memos for House Bill 22 and 23. Uh, Representative Tom Mert, a Republican, is going to be the prime sponsor of House Bill 22. Representative Steve Samuelson, a Democrat, um, will be the prime sponsor of 23. So in this year, they would have to be introduced. They'd have to be passed. House Bill 22 would have to be passed by summer of 2020 so that there's that three-month advertising window before the next general election. House Bill 23 would need to be passed by the end of session in 2020. We're kind of hopeful that both will pass this session because we're seeing leadership in both houses kind of quietly acknowledging that they probably ought to fix this <laughs> before the next redistricting. Um, we're hopeful. We're, we're, um, we actually have a meeting scheduled um, to talk with, with lead, uh, committee chairs on this topic, and we're hopeful that, that this will move forward. Um, remember, 2020 is also the year of the census. And so it's really important for fair districts and anybody who cares about having real representation to also be helping do outreach to make sure it's a fair census, to make sure that everybody participates in the census. If we have communities that step back and say, ooh, you know, there's questions on there that, that threaten us, um, that's a problem. Whatever the census is, we're going to be working really, really hard to make sure everybody participates. Um, we're also going to be looking for ways to make sure that incarcerated people are counted in their home communities rather than in their places of incarceration. So the census is an important issue for us. Um, we're going to be focusing on that as we move towards 2020. So if those bills are passed in 2020, in 2021, we've got a commission ready to go, ready to be selected, ready to be trained. Um, and ready to do the congressional redistricting as soon as the data is released by the Census Bureau, which would be early 2021. At the same time, we'd have to make sure that the other bill, 20, House Bill 22, was passed very quickly in the next session and went to referendum in May of 2021. We're pretty confident that if it went to referendum, it would pass because what we've seen is redistrict, redistricting reform bills when they go to referendum around the country, pass from anywhere to 60 to 78 percent are the percentages. Um, people want a fair process, um, but at the same time, we need to continue to do public education so people understand what the question is if it shows up on a referendum. And if it does pass, we've already got a commission in place, already trained, already working, and then they're just handed legislative districts as well. They continue with their public meetings and there's new maps drawn by the end of 2021 by an independent commission. That's the goal we're working toward. And we think it's possible, we think it's doable, but it's a heavy lift, it's a steep climb, and we continue to need help. There will be other bills introduced, we know that for sure. Um, there were other bills introduced in the last session, um, and some of them have merits, some of them have interesting ideas. Um, this is a national conversation, and you just heard from um, Congressman Fitzpatrick. There's, there's, um, there's a couple bills in, in Congress. There's different ways to approach this. Um, the bill that we're working on, we've been working on for several years, talking to legislators, talking to national experts. Um, there's, there's discussion about whether partisan data should be used to, to test it out. Should we be building competitive districts or should we be, be creating districts that reflect their communities? So to, to have truly competitive districts, when you've got areas like parts of Lancaster that are completely red, you might have to draw crazy district lines to get those to be competitive. But if it's a really, really red district, let the election be in the primary as long as there's real representation. But in a state like ours, most of our districts should be competitive, even if they're not drawn with partisan data, just simply drawn to reflect their community. So that's an ongoing conversation. I'm happy to continue it. Um, <laughs> But there will be other bills. We're focusing on the bills that we've worked really hard on, that we've had a lot of discussion with, hundreds of conversations with legislators, hundreds of over 600 public meetings now on those, on those bills. And we've had people read them and comment on them and discuss them and think about them. So we're not really worried about other bills that will be introduced. We know some of them are just legislators who say, these are never coming for a vote. I just want my name on a bill. Some of them have told us that. We also know there will be some that will be saying, you can't fix legislative, so we're going to do this. And we're going to say, OK, nice. We're just going to continue working on the bills that we're working on. Um, I want to go back to a little bit of history really quickly. When we started this, we, we talked about Red Map 2010. Carl Rove 
in 2010 looked at Pennsylvania as the poster child for gerrymandering. Talked away about the way that district lines had given Republicans from 11 to 10 when Pennsylvania lost two seats. The Republicans still gained a seat. They went from 11 to 12. Well, Democrats went from 10 down to seven. That's what happened in 2001. So the Red Map 2010 was designed around that concept. And there's a lot, I don't bother to read that unless you want to, but this was online. When I found it online, I said, that's amazing. This is like public acknowledgement of voter fraud, of rigging elections, bragging about rigging elections, and saying that they had spent money, a million dollars in Pennsylvania, to do this, to go from what had been, remember before 2011, before 2001, 11 to 10, I put it there, before 2001, 11 to 10, then it went to 12-7, and then after 2011, it went to 13-5. The population hadn't changed. The voter registration hadn't changed. Simply by drawing lines, one party took more power, even as we were losing seats, that one party was gaining seats. Now what we saw was at that time, when we started in 2016, the Democrats were saying, we finally get it. We get it, and we're gonna work on this. They started something called Advantage 2020, and if you had looked at the website in 2020, that was the graphic on the website in 2020. Recognize that district? Us. We're the top target because we are the largest swing state out there, and we have the worst campaign finance laws. We are the top target. But interestingly, um, gerrymandering has become a public uh, topic, and people don't like the idea that people think it's okay to control elections. So Advantage 2020 apparently has vanished. It's been replaced by the National Democratic Redistricting Committee. And on their website, you can find a page about Pennsylvania. And the plan is here to target our state, Senate, and House races. That's the plan. Um, and to quietly try to stall any attempt to change the legislative redistricting process. Red Map 2020 also has apparently vanished. That was announced back in 2015, 2016, goal of $125 million. Uh, Red Map 2020 is not being talked about. Instead, we have the new National Republican Redistricting Trust. And again, Pennsylvania, will be a top topic. On their website, there's an article that says, states like Pennsylvania, as well as the other states, having your party in the majority means you have a major impact in redrawing voting maps. This topic is not gonna go away, and both parties will be pouring millions, millions into Pennsylvania to control the process unless it gets fixed. At the same time, we've got some other interesting things happening. The governor announced his redistricting reform commission. Um, Republicans have said they're not participating. But there seems to be some interest among the Republicans to say, we're not participating because we're already working on it. And there almost seems like it's possible that they might try to get something done before the commission comes out with their report, which would not be a bad thing. Um, certainly, it would be of interest. We're watching. Um, we're going to encourage people to participate. Uh, our league president, Susan Carty, is on that commission. Uh, the chair of the commission is the head of another one of our partners, um, David Thornburg from Committee of 70. We'll be watching, encouraging people to participate. Um, but they can't enact legislation. Um, they can recommend. And we're hoping that we'll have something moving forward even before that. Um, House Resolution 1 in Congress is also of interest. That would put in place, uh, recommend a redistricting commission. Um, that's not going to go anywhere that we would expect right away, but it's certainly raising the discussion. This discussion is a national conversation, and there's lots of ways that we can participate, lots of ways that we can focus energy. Um, and we're going to be working on the bills that we have, but we know there's going to be lots of noise in this space in the years ahead. We know, too, that a majority of Americans would like the Supreme Court to do something about partisan gerrymandering. There are cases that are working their way through the courts. What will happen with them? We don't know, but we do know whatever the court does, it's not gonna completely remove the process from the hands of the legislators themselves. They might put, they might put 
some parameters around it. They might put some limits on it. But the people in the back room, unless we change the process, are going to be the same people in the back room. And they're the ones who are getting more and more sophisticated. So they might make maps that don't look like our maps do. But there are ways to gerrymander without creating crazy looking maps. It's very sophisticated. And so we need to continue to focus on changing the who of the process so that those people in the back room are not drawing sophisticated maps that keep themselves in power. Here's the thing you need to remember. No matter what single issue is important to you, if we don't have a responsive legislature, it doesn't matter. You can change the people you vote for. You can vote people in and out. But if those people are among the many who have, there's no way that they can get their bills heard. There's no way that their votes count. It doesn't really matter who those people are. Nothing changes unless the foundational issues change. So how can you help? We've been working on um, getting people to sign a petition. Um, we've had people do that at polling places. Uh, we, will have, we, will, we will be looking for volunteers for the primary May 21st. It's not a huge turnout election, but the people who do vote on primaries are people who care about democracy. And those are some of our best volunteers have come to us through polling place petitions. Um, and so if you have any interest in giving a couple hours, sign our petition today. You'll get an email inviting you to do this. And it's actually a lot of fun. I did it last um, time. It was really fun to talk to people about democracy as they came out from, from the polling place. Uh, we, we talk to them as they come out about what they can do to make sure that their votes count in the future. Uh, also, we have people who do this in their own communities. We have people in senior communities who've just circulated petitions and gathered hundreds of names for us in those communities or on college campuses. Um, we've been doing resolutions with local governments. We're up to close to 300. Um, more than 56% of the state is now covered by resolutions in support of an independent redistricting commission. Um, you can see Bucks County. We have some. Uh, we have lots of areas where we would like to have uh, resolutions. And the yellow means there's been resolutions started but not completed. So introduced, not voted on. Um, and for the county, there's a resolution that's been introduced but not, not been approved. So we'd look, be happy to have support with that. Um, postcards. Uh, we have had thousands and thousands and thousands of postcards. One group uh, in Center County took their postcards, got um, staple guns, stapled them to a board um, to present to our majority leader, uh, Senator Corman. Um, it did get his attention. Um, so creative, creative use of postcards. Um, hundreds of visits with legislators um, simply to go and say, this is, this is why this matters to us. This is what we'd like you to do. And we've heard back from legislators who say, you know, your folks are really um, informed, um, really polite, and really persistent. And that's what we want to be. We want to be informed. We want to be polite. But we want to say, we do expect you to answer us. And so if we come to you and you have a question, we will come back with the answer. <laughs> and we want you to, to support this. Um, so we've logged hundreds of, of meetings with legislators I mean, we've gathered in Harrisburg. We had one of the largest rallies in recent memory um, in Harrisburg last April with around 700 people in the rotunda. Um, it was a wonderful opportunity to say, this place belongs to us. And that's what we want to remember. Our government belongs to us. Harrisburg, the capital, belongs to us. The capital in DC belongs to us. Not to the, the legislators are part of us, mm -hmm. but it's not their house, it's our house. It's our, it's our government and it works best when we engage, when we understand it, when we participate. Just one last thing to put in your mind. Um, building unexpected coalitions is a really important part of, of, of moving towards change. In, Cal in, in Ohio, the Ohio Manufacturers Association and the AFL-CIO, often on opposite ends of the political spectrum, agreed that redistricting is harming the state. So together, they came out with a, a joint endorsement of a redistricting reform measure in Ohio. Just a couple weeks ago, um, business leaders in Virginia, Maryland, and DC said the government shutdown is an economic disaster for our region. And the thing that drives something like the government shutdown is partisan, partisan divide. And we've got to end it. And they said the, the best way to end it is to have independent redistricting commissions to end gerrymandering, so we move back towards the middle. They came out with a joint statement. They've started something called the Democracy Group, which is working on redistricting reform. We would love to see business leaders 
in Pennsylvania come out with statements like that. We'd love to see kind of new coalitions between unexpected partners coming out in that kind of work. How can you help? All the things I just mentioned, follow us on Facebook. We now have a Fair Districts PA Twi uh, Bucks County on Twitter. Um, we also have Fair Districts PA on Twitter. Request a speaker. We have lots of speakers. As I said, we've had over 600 public meetings around the state in schools, in churches, synagogues, um, rotary clubs, libraries, um, whatever you can think of. We've had speakers. Um, and we have a local group that is always looking for volunteers. I have to say, I'm, I'm part of the league. I'm part of Fair Districts PA. Both are wonderful groups of people um, who care, who are passionate, who who are engaged, um, willing to share what they know, and um, come and join us. Um, one last thing. This is a really important moment in our democracy. This is one of those moments where, where we all need to lean in. I mean, there are times when it's perfectly fine to hang out in the hammock in your backyard, and there's times when the house is on fire and you really need to get up and do something. This is one of those times when the house is on fire, and we all need to get up and we all need to do something. So thank you so much. Um, I'm going to get back to that slide just so you can be thinking about ways you can engage. I just did it again. Uh, anyhow, thank you. <laughs>